comments in the chat today. And we talked about the real time record, so that's the document that includes all the presentations that will happen this evening. And that is also on Tampa Bay Next, where everything is public information. You can go in there and you look at the presentations after this evening. So at this time, I'd like to introduce Bill Jones and Ed McKinney with the Florida Department of Transportation. All right, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Uh, first thing I'm going to ask you is hold your applause until we're completely finished. <laughs> uh, so first of all, uh, thank you for spending your Tuesday evening with us. We uh, realize there's a lot of important things going on. I'm sure we have a lot of things uh, more important than this. Fortunately, uh, for us, we don't have much more important things than this. This is really a project that's done. This, this program is not only extremely important to the Department of Transportation, but if we look at our region, challenges that we face, and it doesn't matter whether you're in Ellis County, or Coral County, or any place in Florida, we're all seeing a tremendous amount of growth. We're seeing our area multiply, more people want to come to Florida than want to leave Florida, and that creates a lot of transportation challenges. And I know uh, folks live in Pinellas County, this is something that you don't experience on a day-to-day -day basis. So what we're trying to do is we're trying to address those issues in a variety of different ways. And what we're going to show you today is, is some of the ways we're addressing it. But we're also, you know, we've got our partners here with uh, Pinellas MPO, uh, PSTA, and, and maybe some others. And the reason why we're all here together is we are all trying to work on this problem. We're all trying to solve a, a, a problem that, is, that, that many folks will say is unsolvable. But we don't believe that. We think there are opportunities for us moving forward. And so that's why we're thankful that you're here uh, to hear this. Um, and actually, everybody in this room gets our own interstate. That's how we're So, any elected officials in the room before I move on? I'm sorry. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Uh, any others? Anybody want to be elected? Okay. So, <coughs> basically, with the Tampa Bay Next program, what we've been doing is we've gone out with a lot of community working groups. We've been coming to you, different small groups, larger groups trying to collect information on, on what is it that, that's, that you value when it comes to transportation. We've heard a lot of things. We've heard over and over again, transit. We, 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 need, more, we need more transit. Well, what does that mean? What is transit? So, you know, we've undertaken a regional uh, transit feasibility study uh, that we'll talk about a little bit later. Uh, we, we're looking at uh, hub stations for, for, tra for transit. Uh, so getting people to locations, but once we get them there, how do we get them around? Um, we're looking at all variety of multimodal options, bike, pedestrian uh, opportunities. So it's not just about a car-centric solution. We are looking to solve this problem. We've got to address it from all angles. Uh, Bill uh, Jones, who is, um, I didn't introduce him, I'm sorry. He's the Director of Development for the Department of Transportation. By the way, I'm in kidding. I'm a uh, Planning and Environmental Administrator for the Department of Transportation. So that's the part where you hold your applause. But, so anyways, but uh, so Bill's my boss. And one of the things he asked us when we took the job on was, you know, what kind of technology solutions? And if anybody's been around to other parts of the, world, of the country or maybe the world where you see a lot more technology devices on, on highways, for example, you might see overhead signs where speeds are adjusted based on the, the level of congestion, or you might see uh, ramp metering where you actually have a traffic signal that, that stops you from going onto an interstate. Uh, and the purpose of that is, is to get you in the system when there's, an op when, when there's free of congestion. And what that does is it creates more flow through the system. So these are kind of technology solutions. And then on top of that, what is autonomous technology, connected vehicle technology? What is that going to bring moving forward? So, uh, so Bill has asked us to, to, to look at that, and we've actually formed a team. We're partnering with a lot of our local agencies, and, and we're, we're going to work together to see what kind of solutions we can bring that, that maybe we don't have to add asphalt. Maybe we could add additional capacity by managing traffic through technology. Uh, we're looking at uh, so different things, and, but again, these are things that we heard from you through the community working groups. And, and we're just we're addressing all of those issues. So we said this in the previous meetings. Tampa Bay Next is not a project. 
I'm going to show you one map that's going to say, we're going to do this, and this is our plan. What it is is a program. It's a program of listening. It's a program of going back and, 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 and giving and showing you ideas and, and making suggestions and working with our partners to see what kind of solutions together we can work on. Uh, so it, it really is a, an attempt to look at all opportunities to create an action plan for transportation. So what we're going to talk about tonight is a variety of topics, and, and again, if there's something you want us to talk about, we're going to be available after this uh, to, uh, to have some conversations about things that you're interested in and we get to address those. We'll talk about the Howard Franklin Bridge, uh, a highly important project, particularly uh, in, in the heels uh, of hurricane. How many people had to evacuate during the hurricane? Just one? First y'all, two. All right. Um, so, well, we could... I can tell you that there was a tremendous amount of volume on the interstate, the Howard Franklin I-275. What was interesting about the volumes is we saw most of the volumes at like three or four in the morning. That's what people, I guess everybody thought, well, there's not going to be any traffic on the road. So a tremendous amount of traffic was on our highways evacuating heading north. Uh, we'll talk about the uh, I-275. Bill's going to talk a little bit about the operational improvements uh, that's being proposed there. We, We'll talk a little bit about Gateway Expressway. Uh, we're going to update you on where we are with the uh, Supplemental Environmental Impact Statement, which is the, uh, the piece from West Shore uh, in, in Hillsborough County all the way out to the downtown interchange, a little bit north and a little bit east. Uh, we'll try to talk about some other projects that are going on in Pinellas County. Uh, an exciting project that PSTA is working on that we've uh, partnered with them, the Central Avenue BRT. And then we'll also talk about uh, 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 another partnership between the department and, uh, and Pinellas County, and that's the water. Group. So the Howard Franklin Bridge, uh, is this what you're thinking of? Sure. I think we had a slide that introduced you. Oh, okay. All right, very good. Just reiterate what Ed said. Thank you so much for being here. I know your time's very valuable. Um, when Ed mentioned, uh, you know, director of development, what's that mean? Everything from the planning side of the house, we have planning unit. We have a Bono unit that actually um, helps work with PSTA on providing grants and uh, transit opportunities. Uh, environmental management, the environmental side of our, of our business, both socio uh, from a uh, so socioeconomic impacts, uh, physical impacts to, to folks, environmental, those kind of things. Um, then we design roads, and we have right-of-way person, those kind of things. So um, I've known Ed for about 15 years, and I just went off script for a second. Um, never had the pleasure of actually working directly with Ed. So when I took this position about 10 months ago, I was fortunate enough to get this. Um, Ed and I picked up the first thing we noticed together was there's a lot of silos. Silos within our own agency, silos across the region. Um, and one of our charges that I've asked Ed and all of our staff is let's break them down. Um, um, we don't need it. Let's all work together. Um, I'm big on collaboration, collaboration, relationships, um, putting our heads together to solve issues. Uh, there's no silver bullet to our transportation issues. Um, you know, Ed, uh, actually in one of his presentations, he might mention it. Um, 2040, we're about going to be the size of Miami, but down where we're at right now. Um, add that to our geographical, I don't want to say challenges, but our unique aspect of our geographical with the water separating us. How are we going to all get around? Um, so there is no silver bullet. Uh, somebody else pointed there's maybe a silver buckshot where it's going to take every little bit of land use, technology, uh, roadway and bridge improvements, but then also uh, transit and other pieces of pie that can come into this. Um, so, more important, now we get to this pretty quickly so we can get the other thing you want to talk about and, and walk around here with some boards and so forth. But uh, since last we spoke, we took some of the comments that we actually got at the meeting, literally at the meeting we got some comments there and elsewhere uh, to talk about uh, some of the uh, projects that are part of the process of campaign. So I want to update you real briefly on this. And given that Hurricane Irma, it's very timely. Um, Howard Franklin Bridge, that's going to construction in late 2019 say around September of 2019, we're going to go to construction. Um, it used to be just a six-lane grid, one express lane in each direction, and there was no pedestrian path. We then received feedback that we need to um, think about the future. Then there was uh, Hurricane Irma hit on that. Uh, what about pedestrian bicycle facilities? We've worked with Hillsborough County as well as Dallas County. Think about pedestrians. How do we get across the Gandhi and or Howard Franklin? So we went back, took a fresh look at it, and we were able to, for economies of scale on this, um, and what we're going to construct and what we're proposing to move forward with, and there's going to be some public hearings we'll talk about in a moment, um, two express lanes in each direction uh, coming across the hard Franklin. That'll come off the Gateway Expressway project, US 
Interest 19, you get on Gateway, all the way through 118th Avenue and then up through here towards the Hillsborough side. You'll then still have your four South Island lanes um, on this bridge that are the non toll lanes. And we're adding a pedestrian bicycle facility, the Courtney Campbell Causeway pedestrian facility. Uh, I'll say something about your crazy for you putting on it. It's, a, it's, it's, it's exceeded our expectations on the leadership. So we're going to look to put that on there and then we'll work with Hillsborough County and Dallas County on what the amenities look like and how the connections actually work in the future. But for now, if we don't do it now, you know, we lose that opportunity then you have to go through a whole new process. So we're excited to, uh, to put that on there as well. Um, something else we're doing, um, if this region ever decides on how to get a, uh, a transit system, a local or a, a regional uh, transit system up to a light rail system, we're going to strengthen the pier here. But I'll show you another slide in a moment. This whole pier system, as well as we call it the superstructure, the deck, will be able to be uh, uh, retrofitted up to a light rail system if the region ever comes to that consensus and funding to get that in place. So probably better to show as we go through. Uh, so in the future, and well, let me go back real quickly. Um, right now, PSTA and, uh, has an express bus that goes from Dallas County into the city of Tampa. There's not much express about going five miles an hour though across the bridge or anywhere. So what this, these express lanes do is allow an express bus service, buses we already have in place to use that at a constant speed of up to 45 miles an hour. So those are attributes that are already there when this bridge is in place to be used for express buses. But if we go to a bigger, more robust regional transit system, I mentioned we're going to have this bridge retrofitable, retroactively able to be uh, uh, to fit to a light rail system. So we would have to come across the bridge, we would take that area, put the rails, literally bolt those down, and then the existing bridge that we're going to, to have remain in place, we would widen that, and that's where those express lanes would come across to this side. Very nicely synchronized with the rest of the system that we have. So um, some of the attributes as we go through improves instant management. We also actually heard from the group that if we had one express lane in each direction, what if there's an accident? Then you can still get to it, we still have shoulders. But they said, what about adding a second lane for instant management? So you can move uh, vehicles out of the way and still get movement through there. Hurricane evacuation is huge. Nellis County, most densely populated uh, county in, in the state or uh, in the county or in the state. Um, significant impacts in, in, on the evacuation. Uh, express bus service, I mentioned, that can be used right away without any uh, regional transit discussion even necessary. We're ready to handle that. Um, bicycle pedestrian, eliminate the need for a third bridge. If you see that in literature, I just wanted to mention it. We would, because the old bridge was, was smaller, we would have had to build a third bridge. So we couldn't have widened the uh, existing bridge we're going to keep. And I'll show you the, the sequence here in a moment as I jump around. Um, and it accommodates future demand. I mentioned, uh, I think, 60. Thousand people came to the Tampa metro area last year, and that's growing, let alone the million that are still coming to our regions, the Tampa Bay region. So it accommodates that future demand and it prepares for autonomous vehicles. We're doing a lot, we're putting a lot of fiber, fiber optic networks through our system. We're working with uh, the Tampa Hillsborough Expressway Authority on connected vehicles. We're doing pilot projects for, for those. Um, and then we're talking to industry experts. As a matter of fact, there's an uh, automated vehicle summit coming, which is November 14th somewhere in there coming to Tampa um, that we're very excited for. It's in the Tampa, it's the whole Florida Navy Summit. And we're talking to experts and they believe the first use of that will be uh, dedicated lanes is likely where uh, a, a, a controlled environment they can use. So it's set up nicely for that as well. So let me jump into something we created just real quick for you. This is the current northbound bridge and this is the southbound bridge. Um, northbound bridge built in about the 1960s. It only had about 50 year service life back then when we did that. Um, there's some design uh, challenges with that that we probably don't do now. Uh, the, the pier or the uh, piles that we throw over are a little bit different. Um, it's also lower. If you remember the Pensacola Bay Bridge, it was, it was Hurricane Matthew. You remember seeing images of that where the bridge that was pushed off Pensacola Bay. This is a similar style where, where wave action is too low. And also, it's corroding under there. We've been I'll say patchwork we got for years, putting millions of dollars into that bridge. So this 1960s bridge, we're going to show you a moment, we're going to demolition, and that's why we're building the new bridge. Per statute, we have to, it's becoming structurally efficient, we have to replace it. So that's why we're even going to this uh, our Franklin Bridge in the first place. Some another question we get a lot of times too, just an FYI, um, why not keep the bridge, use it for a fishing pier, use that for the transit or the uh, pedestrian facility. 
unfortunately, it'd be such a liability. It literally, uh, the corrosion and what we have going on is such a liability. We need to remove that bridge. So, what we're going to do is the construction sequence. Right now, actually, is if you drive anybody to see the barges that are sitting out there, they're out there right now coring. They're doing geotechnical work to test the uh, substructure right there, the substrate. They're testing that right now. We have a contract. We want to give as much information to the contractor that's going to win this contract so he can uh, get a competitive bid for us as the, as the state and his taxpayers. So they're out there now. That same footprint, that's where we, the contractor, will set up. He'll first do his substructure work. He'll drive the piles, he'll place his foundations. So you'll see that a lot of time as you're driving through this. No obstruction to uh, traffic. And then as you come through, we anticipate this to be a beam bridge, meaning just a beam will cross across uh, these versus sometimes you see segmental bridges kind of Lego together. So this will be a, a, a beam on cap bridge. And then we'll come through and we'll deck it. It's concrete deck. You have your express lanes barrier separated. Uh, that was, again, was a comment that, uh, that folks prefer versus uh, some other options. Um, and then we get to this. Then let's make the switch. So your traffic's here. We complete this. We, uh, we do our inspection, we stripe it, we put our signage out there, and then you'll notice here the switch is going to happen. So we'll then switch our new traffic pattern over to the new bridge, uh, replace the pedestrian, and then the express lanes. And then you'll notice the northbound lanes are still open where they used to be. We're then going to shift those, restrike this, make sure anything needs to be done for this, uh, uh, signage and so forth. And then we're going to use the 1990s bridge, it's built, bridge built in the 90s. Uh, to then handle the northbound traffic. We'll then go in and demolish the, uh, the old 1960s bridge as we go through. Um, public hearings, I mentioned in Pinellas, uh, Carolina area, November 16th, we're going to have a public hearing on this. And then November 14th, uh, on, the, on the Hillsborough side, we're going to hold a public hearing with the preferred alternative, as I showed you there. And a lot of questions we get then. So let's jump into okay, we have the bridge fixed. We always come to that ball line then. We get to the two lanes. We found a way to increase capacity and get a third lane through that, that ball line as we have now. So you go under the bridge there, you connect down the two lanes. Let's see if it shows it here. Um, so come across the bridge, you have your bottom line there. This is probably a better way to look at it. We have a, a, a diagram. Come across the bridge, and you always pinch point here's the Here's the two lanes you always can pinch on. We can work to restrike that and work the uh, our, our engineers pull three lanes through that. And then once you get to the loop ramp, here's another huge uh, component of this. Now you get the loop ramp, you get the merge into the lane, then you have to merge into your three lanes. We're going to carry, if you're on the outside edge of that loop ramp, you're going to carry forward and you never have to stop. That's part of the four lane system that was constructed last year. If you're on the inside, even with that though, you have a merge at some point. You can take that all the way across, all the way to Dale Mabry, actually. actually. So uh, you have a huge distance to, uh, to do your weaving and, and, and get across there for your uh, any turbulence that, that would have been created. Uh, we're going to widen the bridges at 60, uh, as well as at West Shore, to make that happen. What this also does too is what this also does too is the Veterans Expressway is coming down into this area. We're doing a Veterans Expressway project that helps alleviate that movement as well for those coming down from veterans as we go through. Uh, doing some other work as well. We're going to increase some uh, some lanage on here so you have a three lane coming off if you're going to Kennedy coming across from the bridge this way. And in Southbound we're going to add another third lane as well and do some ramp work. So this is about a $25 million project. We're going to get this out the door as fast as we can. We're shooting for early 2019, mid-2019 as we speak, probably early 2019. Uh, to get that moving, probably a year, 400 day project. Uh, but we're going to try to accelerate that as much as possible uh, because we know we can't wait for the relief of the entire interchange as part of the supplemental environmental impact statement that Ed mentioned. We'll speak a little bit more about. Um, so then the next question, and we have some graphics back here. I'm going through this fast. Sorry to look up north, and I'm able to do this quickly. Um, we have some some uh, uh, boards back here that can explain this. So the next question is: if we build the Howard Franklin Bridge. What's going to happen to those two express lanes that come across? We've worked out a geometric configuration. So I mentioned this is the this is the existing condition as if we built our interim project that we just spoke about that we're, we would have completed before the Howard Franklin. Howard Franklin is not a four-year job. So once you have your express lanes come across, we found that about 50% of your traffic actually coming across Howard Franklin 
I don't know if you've noticed this yourself driving. Actually, about 50, 55 percent gets off at the 60 ramp there. You can go to TIA, go to Veterans, or to 60 that way towards Rocket Point. So we're going to have an egress point or an exit point out of the express lanes where you then have uh, several thousand feet to get across if you're taking that Kennedy exit. And then the other one will carry forward, and we run the numbers on traffic modeling to then merge into your system here. Once a future interchange is done here, full interchange, these two express lanes would just then carry forward into the system if that's what's chosen. So that's a, that's a question we always get about the operations of this as we go through. Um, Gateway, we're, we're excited to say that that project, we've let that. Uh, we're on about the 20th plan submittal. It's called a design build where we have a designer team with a contractor so they can work more efficiently together, work through issues and challenges and it's cheaper and it's faster for the, for the department. That has started. So that project is, uh, is slated 2021, maybe even before we have a bonus on that because we know how this it is. Um, but if we. I use that every day. Okay. And like today is always the case. You have to finish the stop and you try to get on. And so if you make it easier to get more traffic on 180 minutes, I don't understand why it won't do what it does every day. Because you can finish the stop or not. Okay, actually, we have some of our CER our contracting uh, managers that are here. We can talk to you right after this about that. So, there's three lanes that come off the triple left on the Allerton. Um, so, the Gateway Project's moving forward. We're moving forward with that um, as we speak. And, like I said, we, we can talk more about that. We have, uh, if you have any issues or concerns about traffic, we have our construction manager here as well. With that, and I'll turn it back to you for a moment. Talk about the SEIS a little bit more. And talk about other projects there. Okay, thank you, Doug. So I mentioned a little bit earlier about the uh, SEIS process. So if any, some of you may recall, uh, last year we talked a lot about, you know, a lot about PDX. And what we heard through a lot of the discussions with the community is that they uh, felt that that document, was, or that, that plan was based on an outdated document that needed to be updated. So working with Federal Highway, uh, we agreed that we were going to reopen that environmental impact statement and do what's called a supplement to that. So basically, you're taking that entire document from beginning to end and you're reevaluating every piece of that and bringing everything the traffic, the noise, the air quality, the social economical impacts, all of those things are going to be brought to current. Uh, 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 So 
uh, basically it's going to operate on what's referred to as a, as a fat lane. What a fat lane is, uh, they, it, let's make it simple. Normally, you want buses, particular bus rapid transit, operating in a dedicated orbit where it doesn't compete with traffic. It doesn't have cross streams, it just flows, and, and there's nothing competing it. Fortunately, with the constraints of the corridor, it's going to have to compete with vehicles. So, what we try to do is minimize that, that interference between the vehicle traffic and the bus by, by restricting only, um, only left turns. So, you can't use that lane if you're in a vehicle. You can't use that lane for crew movements. You have to be making the next left turn uh, or you have to be in one of the uh, other right lanes. So, um, uh, we're excited uh, about moving that project forward. And uh, so, again, like I said, we have PST in the vehicle. And we're also excited that we were able to partner to, uh, with the city. We've uh, got a transit uh, grant of $438,000 uh, to, uh, to operate the water ferry. Again, that was a highly popular um, um, transportation mode connected to downtown Tampa with St. Pete. And we're excited to see that project move forward. Again, this is looking at this problem of many solutions. And, and Bill mentioned, and I think it kind of went over a lot of people's heads. Think about the size of Miami today. Miami has express lanes, they have Metro Rail, People Mover, um, they have uh, uh, another form of rail. Uh, Tri-Rail, thank you. Yeah, it's nice to have experts. On that. So, um, and they still have congestion. Now you take that population, you extract it out of, the, out of Miami, you dump it in this area in 2040, that's what we're going to be dealing with when we look at the congestion Traffic. That doesn't draw your attention, but that doesn't make you concerned about what we, the challenges we have in front of us. Then maybe, well, I'm sure everyone in this room is definitely, because you wouldn't be here if you did. So we're excited about working with our partners. As Bill said, we are trying to break down silos. This is no longer, you know, the Department of Transportation doing its thing and, and the local governments doing their thing. We realized that. It takes all of us partnering together, looking at parallel facilities. How does their system interact with our system? How do we how do we better integrate those two systems with transit opportunities? Uh, connected, you know, many of you, I use Waze to get here. And one one interesting thing about Waze, Waze doesn't care if you're using, if you're going to be on a state road or a local road. All it wants to do is get you to the location you want to get to as fast as you can. Now, when I go home from work every day, I put my, I, I punch in home and it, and it tells me what direction to go. And I noticed lately it's been taking me through neighborhood streets. It actually takes me through a, a neighborhood in Temple Terrace. And, and I'm sure the people, folks in Temple Terrace probably aren't too crazy about ways sending all this traffic into their community. But that's what's happening, right? That's what's going to occur as we get more and more congestion. Ways is not going to be it, it, it's going to be indiscriminate. It's going to choose the fastest route. It doesn't matter if it's through a neighborhood street, a school zone, or wherever it is. It's going to take you there. So, you know, we've got to start thinking in terms of how do we want to address our is that the is that the appropriate use of our local streets? If not, then we need to start finding ways to to encourage vehicle uh, traffic to not not to be in those neighborhoods. So, uh, I know Councilwoman Caudell is here. I'm not sure. I wonder if she wanted to acknowledge. Uh, Georgia, she's she still here. Okay. Uh, if you see her around, uh, she's off. She can't do it again. So we've got a tremendous amount of meetings and outreach that we're going to be continue doing. If there's, if you're a member of a neighborhood association and you would like us to come out and talk with your group, uh, please let us know. We would be more than happy. Uh, as Bill and I said, we probably spend more evening for the, out of the, out making presentations than we spend at home. But uh, that's okay. We're trying to get this message out. We think that's how important this, this is. Um, why don't we have the, uh, has anyone attended one of the, or listened in on one of the Citizens Transportation Academy? Is Julie? Julie? Come on, we are putting a lot of work into these things. So if you're not, well, do well, we present it. Uh, that, that kind of counts. So what we're trying to do is demystify all of this terminology and all the it, it really is not that so, not that complicated. I think if you put it in the context of things that you deal with on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, if you have a two-bedroom house and you plan on having six kids, you know that's going to be a challenge for you, right? So your options are, you know, either pile them in a room or you got to buy a bigger house. And if and if all of a sudden your in-laws from, from New Jersey want to move in with you and, and 
from other parts of the world. You, you start dealing with, you know, you have to figure out, okay, do I got to buy a bigger house or do I got a rental to tear down the walls of my house? And how much money is this going to cost me? Where's the money going to come from? How am I going to pay for it? And what kind of beds are they going to sleep on? It really is that simple, folks. It's not that complicated. We're dealing with those same challenges. We're getting bigger. Someone used a, a reference in a meeting, you know, and they equated it to somebody that's getting fat, you can speak fast. Well, it's not really that at all. I equate it more of a, of a young kid that's growing up, and that's really what the Tampa Bay region is doing. It's continuing to grow. And you can't ask a, a kid that's continuing to grow to wear the same clothes you wore years ago. You've got to buy them new clothes. So that's the challenges that we're faced with. It's not that complicated. So what we're trying to do with our Citizens Transportation Academy is make you better informed, give you ammunition and so uh, the ammunition and a better understanding of what are these things that we're talking about, and what are our challenges, and how can you help us with those challenges. So I strongly encourage if you haven't attended one, they're out on YouTube, right? And you can watch them all, you can cover your family together, pop some popcorn, it would make a great evening. I'm sure Whit would love it, he'll be around to sign autographs later. But it really is a, a, an opportunity for us to get you better informed so that you could be a better and active participant in this conversation, which you need to be. Uh, we've got uh, several of them coming up. Uh, some webinar courses, I'm not sure what those are. Which webinar courses are there? Is that part of the training? Is that the same thing? Okay. Uh, All right. So with that, I think I'm turning it over to Whit. Okay. But again, thank you all for coming out tonight. We really appreciate it. And yeah, uh, we've got a lot of folks here from uh, from our office, and, and uh, we've got some consultants here. Uh, we'll be here as long as we need to to answer your questions. And um, so feel free afterwards to visit the display. Thank you very much. Thank you. And I'd like to acknowledge also first uh, nurse here. Thank you for being here. Uh, and Green Connell as well. I talked about earlier. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about the parallel efforts that we're beginning which feeds in really well with the Tampa Bay Next process, and that's the next long-range transportation plan for Pinellas County. And we're a planning organization for Pinellas. We don't build anything. We don't construct anything. We don't make anything that hopefully good decisions. And we take a long-term view of those good decisions, and we engage all of our partners at the city level, at the county, at the department, at PFTA, um, so that we can develop an integrated long-range transportation. This is the first plan that we're going to be doing as forward Pinellas. In the past, our long-range plan was developed right at the beginning of the merger of the Pinellas Planning Council and the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Now that we're merged, now that we have better staff alignment, now that we have better direction from our board, we have a unified 13-member board that covers both land use and transportation, we figured we need a new plan. We need a new way of looking at the vision for Pinellas County and how we best operationalize that. Some of the key things that are going to be very different in this plan are really a focus on economic sustainability, uh, economic opportunity, and uh, resilience. Uh, big issue with Hurricane Irma, big issue with uh, just all the different issues related to sea level rise and whatever. So we're having to take these into account. We branded this under a framework of Adapt, Build, Connect. ABC, simple to remember, we have to adapt to respond to these changing at a global level, at a national level, and at a statewide level, we have to build the right things in the right places. And that means being sensitive to neighborhoods. Uh, it means being thoughtful about our planning and giving clear expectations to developers. And it means not only just connecting our networks, so street, bicycle, and transit networks, but it means connecting people to a sense of identity, a sense of neighborhood attachment, a sense of community. And I think that's a real important thing to consider in transportation. Now, we're not isolated here in Pinellas County because it's not just us in Pinellas doing our plan because we are a connected region. Many of our workers, uh, I think it's about 30% or so, uh, work in Hillsborough County. We have a fair amount of workers who work in uh, Pasco County and Manatee County and vice versa. So people who live in those counties also come to our county to work. So the process that we're going to embark on is different this time. We're going to have one plan for the region. It is going to be a regional plan that is jointly developed by Pasco, Hillsborough, and Pinellas NPOs. And if you think of it like a three-ring binder, the first 
first, and it's not going to be 50 pages, but the first 50 pages are going to be that regional plan. And then the second 50 pages will insert into that document, will be the fellows plan. PASCO will insert their 50 pages, and Hillsboro will insert their 50 pages. So we would all have a shared document. And if Hillsboro wanted to make an amendment to those first 50 pages of change, then we all have to agree. We all have to adopt that change. If we wanted to make a change on our end to, say, a bunch of sidewalk projects or a, a minor roadway project in our Pinella section, we don't have to take that to the But if we wanted to change those first 50 pages, we'd have to get concurrence from Hillsboro and Pasco. I hope that makes sense to you all. We're still figuring it out, but that's the plan, and that's, that's what we're sticking to. As we go through that, developing a regional plan, we're going to be looking at scenarios for growth and development that dovetail in with the transportation projects that Ed and Bill just talked about from the Tampa Bay Next program perspective and also from the regional public transportation feasibility plan perspective. And we'll be looking at things like what is the trend for development, where growth is happening, uh, the types of transportation that people are making now, how will that continue in the future? And then we'll be looking at some other uh, scenarios that may spin off a transit investment, which is more transit-oriented development in this region that we've seen today. Uh, a beltway concept is being looked at, and there may be some other concepts. Those scenarios are not developed yet. We're just at the talking stage of what those scenarios will look like, and they'll begin taking shape in the first part of 2018. And I encourage you to weigh in on what those scenarios look like. We'll have public input opportunities to do so in terms of public survey, uh, interactive polling, and things like that. As we get along in those scenarios, we start evaluating them against performance measures. Uh, we'll then look at funding and revenue generation that will come from those different scenarios because they have impact. As you develop your land development patterns differently, they have an influence on how much revenue you generate from property taxes and gas taxes and things like that. And frankly, gas taxes are probably going away in the future, so we have to look at how new technologies are disrupting the traditional sources of revenue that we have for transportation. That'll be part of our scenarios as well. And we're all crystal balling in this room. Your opinions and your perspective are probably as good as ours because, frankly, um, it's hard to see 10, 15, 20 years in the future, but that's what we're charged with doing. So we have to, through scenarios, look at some what ifs. What if this happens, and what are the uh, relationship from that. So I just want to link back to the Tampa Bay Next process that uh, Ed talked about. We're going to be incorporating into the 2045 Long Range Transportation Plan all of these elements, whether it's interstate modernization or freight mobility, the innovative emerging technologies related to transportation, or complete streets in our bike path network. It's all going to fit in. We've got to look at this in partnership. So I don't want anybody out there saying, that's DOT's Tampa Bay Next Step. It's our collective effort. And we really have to be shared and involved in that and not point fingers at, oh, DOT's doing something we don't like. Because if they're doing something we don't like, it's our responsibility to, to modify it in the long range transportation plan. And conversely, if we're doing something that DOT supports or doesn't like in our long range transportation plan, it's their responsibility to either fund it or not. And we have to get those partnerships worked out before it gets to that point of conflict. And I think this process is really setting us up to avoid conflict, and that's what we're hoping for. Another component that we haven't talked about too much, and I think Bob may be speaking to, is the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. We're very excited about this. We're uh, excited that DOT has stepped up and showing some real leadership in funding this program, uh, because uh, what it's yielding is not anything that's uh, completely innovative that we've never heard before, but it is the first time that the Department of Transportation is stepping up and leading at the table saying, we're ready to help invest in this. And we're setting the table to make the decisions that need to be made at the local level to support ongoing operations and maintenance of whatever emerges easier. And um, that's really a breath of fresh air. So this, what you're after seeing now is the uh, preferred connections that are coming out of that first phase of the process. The dark blue lines include the Central Avenue Bus Rapid Transit Project in the south, but it also shows a connection to Wesley Chapel to downtown Tampa, to West Shore to Gateway, to downtown St. Petersburg, with a connection uh, linking Clearwater to the Gateway employment area, 
that just makes a ton of sense. This has been studied endlessly in our region. No surprise to anybody who's been involved in transportation planning in our region for the last 20 years, this is emerging as a corridor or a connection that is supported by population, employment, and ridership. The lighter blue lines are supporting connections that are equally important to that primary spine. What we have yet to figure out, and that will be the next phase, is how do we phase this and compartmentalize these segments so that we can get funding at the federal and state level and advance them. And frankly, which county is going to step up and say, we're in the game and we support ongoing operations is going to be determinative of how many of these go forward first and second and third and such. But each of these are important and it's all part of a vision for how a system of transportation connections can work. So we're going to dovetail on that and talk a little bit about Pinellas. And planning for our future in Pinellas County is really both a land use and a transportation perspective. And again, I want to go back to that adapt, build, connect. And what does adapt mean? It means responding to a shifting economic environment, uh, planning for changing demographics. You know, Pinellas has had this leadership for a long time. We're older than a lot of the rest of Florida. But Florida as a whole is older than a lot of the rest of the state. And that trend is going to continue. But we also want to plan for attracting the next generation of workers and keeping those folks who are in middle school today, high school today, in our county, if they want to be in our county, giving them good job opportunities and good transportation options to do that. Uh, technology, vulnerability, um, and a changing policy environment is probably a substantial change that we've had in a long time in Washington. Uh, building means guiding growth to the right locations, building community, and importantly, building capacity. Building capacity for our cities and our citizens to take leadership roles in their communities as well. Building trust in the process by being transparent, being clear, and communicating early and often, and building connected networks, regardless of mode. And connect means working as one region to unite our community uh, and districts through transportation, reinforcing that sense of identity, and providing avenues for productive and meaningful dialogue. That's all what we mean by connect. We're going to start from a foundation of something our board did uh, two years ago to establish what we call the Spotlight Initiative, strategic planning and operations topic. And the board chose three areas. One was the gateway area, that's in purple. We're leading a master plan that's starting this fall for the gateway area to look at land use and transportation to optimize development patterns in that area so that they can become more supportive of community, more supportive of transit, more supportive of walking and bicycling. And frankly, that's a 40 or 50 year evolution, but we have to start. And if we're looking at regional transit coming into the gateway area, right now we're not set up to receive that. So how do we make those connections happen? The next area is the US-19 quarter, and our board has charged us with coming up with a vision for US-19. So we've initiated market research initiatives and uh, express bus plans to look at um, ways to optimize the US-19 quarter. It's already got the ITS technology, and we've already built many of the interchanges, and we'll probably continue those interchanges up to the north, at least for a distance. So how do we make the most effective use of that corridor? Down to the south, the 34th Street area, we're actually looking at humanizing 34th Street so that it's better for pedestrians, bicyclists, and transit in the Skyway Marine District. So it's not a one-size-fits-all approach. We're going to be looking at segmenting US-19 and tailoring our strategies accordingly. Plus, it's a huge barrier for people to go east-west, so how do we get our pedestrians and bicyclists to connect through the US-19 corridor so they can access services or transit? And the last area is enhancing beach community access. And I like to tell people that at least the one unique thing that Pinellas County contributes to the region is the beaches and the $9 billion of economic value that they contribute uh, overall. We contribute a lot more than just our beaches, but that's a real signature piece for our Tampa Bay region. So as we look at enhancing beach community access, it's the bridges, it's the gap between the Pinellas Trail and, the, and uh, Gulf Boulevard uh, that's often very unsafe and inhospitable if you're on a bike or you're a pedestrian. Uh, it's how do we maximize access to Clearwater Beach, to Tampa International Airport, and so on. And we'll be looking at applying complete streets principles, looking at land use, looking at key transportation investments in each of these areas. Folks, this is the foundation of our 2045 long-range transportation plan. The 
because there's not a lot else that's changing outside of these areas because it's a lot of established neighborhoods. Um, and downtown St. Pete has a, evolved. It has a guiding master plan. Downtown Clearwater is looking at Imagine Clearwater 2040. So there's a lot of things that are in place that we're building on that uh, this reflects. I also want to talk about advancing transportation projects that support the countywide land use vision. And we do have a countywide land use plan with a vision that's adopted as of August of 2015 that our board maintains. And every city in Pinellas County and the county has to be consistent with that land use plan. So we've identified areas that project future growth. We're going to be looking at travel trends and travel demand. And we're going to be setting transportation priorities to support that. So think of our land use plan as the vision, and then think of the transportation plan as the capital improvements program that we need to support that vision. So what are we going to be doing different in this long-range plan? There's quite a few things. One is, because it's the first forward development plan, we're going to be developing one integrated plan that addresses all modes uh, and establishes modal priorities by course. Uh, so what that means is we're going to be working in lockstep with CFTA to establish one countywide transportation plan. And we'll be branding those plans similarly. PSA will have its own document, but it will have the same look and feel as our long range plan and vice versa. We won't be pointing at PSTA saying, what are you guys doing in your plan? It'll be one shared plan for the county. But we are also um, undertaking a significant rewrite of our bicycle pedestrian master plan to identify strategic priorities in that plan. And it's probably going to be linked with a community bus plan for PSTA. There's people who take transit or always pedestrian on one end of the trip at least. And the complete streets, we're going to be working with Pinellas County. And St. Pete's already in a leadership mode. They've already developed a complete street strategy, and they're now working that through the public engagement process. Um, but Clearwater is just starting, and the county is now interested in looking at all the county roads and screening them for what kind of changes need to be made to make those county roads safer and more accommodating for bicyclists, pedestrians, and transit riders. Uh, so that's a big sea change, and that's a huge step forward for the county. And what we want is clarity in the long-range plan for not necessarily every strategy and every change on every roadway, but these are the corridors where you can expect change to happen. It might be a lane reduction. It might be that we're moving to a lane width. It might mean that we're adding a separate trail facility we don't know yet yet, and, and we probably won't get into all those details in our much plan, but we will be identifying segments and then prioritizing those segments. We've already talked about the role of emerging technology, but here's one real key where technology is going to change. If you look at the gateway area, for instance, and you add up all the surface parking lots that are out there in the gateway today, it's a large number of developed land that probably isn't developed to its highest and best use. And as we have autonomous connected vehicles 15 years down the road and maybe sooner, are we going to need all that parking or can we repurpose some of that parking? Are we going to need to incorporate into site planning drop-off zones uh, for people who are using connected vehicles or autonomous vehicles? Those are some things we have to think about that aren't anticipated in our land use plans today. So we need to take a leadership role in looking at that. And then frankly, we need a funding strategy for transit investment. And so through this long-range plan, we plan to look at all of our revenue sources, and we're going to have to make this commitment before 2019 when we adopt our plan, but we're going to have to at least look at how we begin paying for transit and how we add to the investment strategy so that transit is an equal partner in the mix of solving our mobility strategy. I'm not going to bore you with too much detail, but we put together one slide that looks at the, the process of developing our plan into four phases. And I'll just cover the basics. The blue is the technical process. The green is the public engagement process, and they dovetail. Phase one is data development. We're in that phase now. We're just starting that effort. We'll be looking at pulling together the trends and, and the conditions countywide. Phase two is the scenarios that I talked about developing and evaluating those scenarios. And we are required to develop performance measures and targets, and then show how we're achieving success towards reaching those targets. That's all getting worked out in phase one and phase two of what those targets are. And frankly, if we adopt targets for mode share, for instance, uh, that say we're going to double our transit ridership in Pinellas, probably like that, then we have to then program transportation projects to help us get that goal. I'm not saying that's our goal, but it might be. Uh, 
Um, so this is going to be something that's really interactive, and you'll see this process unfold. Phase three is our fiscal priority. So in a long-range plan, we have to we have a finite set of revenue, and we have to allocate those revenues to, to different projects and make sure that we prioritize. And then phase four is our vision strategy. And that's more than just going out with a message saying, hey, we've got a vision. That's looking at how we change our policies to support the investment choices and priorities that we're making. We haven't always done a great job of that, and that's, I won't single Penelope County on. That's been a challenge throughout Florida, but that's something we're going to try and accomplish here. Looking at our quarters and looking at how we can optimize the quarters from a development standpoint to support the investments we're making, whether it's highway, complete streets, or transit. So phase one, data development, I've kind of run through all this. This will go through mid-2018, population and employment projections. We're going to be looking at focus groups and getting an engaged group of citizens that will stick with us throughout this uh, four-phase process and doing statistically valid surveys of the public so we can come back to what the public has told us in depth about transportation. Uh, PSK will be doing an onboard survey as well. Uh, phase two for our scenarios and alternative development, uh, we'll have a second focus group focusing on needs and priorities. Um, we'll be looking at death testing these different scenarios and their impact on development, transportation, and land use. Phase three, physical implications and priorities, and that'll be late 2018 through 2019. Um, and then we'll um, really focus on what are the new revenue sources that we might be able to identify, and how do we replace that gas tax by 2020, 2030, 2040, whenever we need to begin looking at that. Um, and then did we get it right? We'll be asking the focus group to to weigh in on that. And then the fourth phase in June and November as we lead up to adoption of the plan in November of 2019 is what are the key policy strategies that we need to change? How do we go out and, and build community support toward that vision direction? And we're going to be building that support throughout. It's not just going to happen at the very end, but that's where the full plan people will be able to see those connections. So I just wanted to say it's all of us together and uh, we can't so hype anymore. We really have to embrace the partnership uh, of moving forward in the last step. So thank you all. Do you have any quick questions for me? What about the, uh, the rail coming down from Brooksville and Tampa and, and the intermodal that's where Charlie's is? And, and how do you see that connecting to Carolina, maybe down that way? Well, that's reflected in that system plan. So you'll see that CSX quarter that's been identified as one of those light blue lines. Um, we have not figured out yet what that cost to buy that track is, and whether it's an economic, whether it makes economic sense to do so, because that's CSX and we're going to negotiate hard. Uh, but that's identified on there. The department is actually doing several intermodal feasibility studies. They've already got the Charlie's property purchased. And now we're looking at the gateway area for where's that pot of land in the gateway, where does that make sense? And there's four others, I think, that the department was looking at throughout our region, those in a normal sense. So that will fit in with that regional premium transit feasibility. So that's you, might, you might know about rail since 2019. Well, I think we're going to have a pretty good conversation about it next year. And then by 2019, we're going to have a strategy of is that the right investment? And we need to come to some conclusion on that. We can't let that just hang around forever. It's pretty broad, but why did Campaign X being done through FDOT directly as opposed to through either you or the It's a great question. And if we were probably one MPO, we would probably need Campaign X. But because we have MPOs in each of the counties, it's really hard for any one of those MPOs to go into the other county and say, hey, we're planning for you. We can do it collaboratively, but then it gets kind of cumbersome. So I think really the department's in the best shape to do it. Plus, you know, they got a ton of pushback on Tampa Bay Express. And that pushback said, you know, you're not looking broad enough. You're not looking at the right options. You're not looking at all the connections you need to be considering. You're pushing a managed toll lane project. So the department said, all right, well, we'll look back. And, look, and they looked. I think what I'm most happy about, if it was just the department out there doing Tampa Bay Next and not engaging us, I'd be worried about that. But that's completely not what they're doing. They are engaging us, they're asking us to be partners, and we're embracing that partnership. So they're leading it, they've got the resources, they've got the manpower. 
but we feel like we're an equal partner in that. Does uh, that's a loaded question. Uh, we support the study of the merger to see if it makes sense and to do it right. But our board has not taken an official position on that. And I'm not going to stand up here and give you my answer. We'll turn it over. I think there will be opportunities for more questions. Thank you very much. All right. Our next speaker is Marco Sandusky. He will talk about the regional transit feasibility plan. Okay. set up here. Good evening, everyone. My name is Marco Sandusky. I'm the Director of Government and Community Relations for HART. Um, thanks for having me over here in Pinellas County um, and to talk about the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. So uh, this is an initiative that uh, we're about a year into, um, and it's a collaboration between HART, which is leading the effort, um, and PSTA, our counterpart here in Pinellas County, and PCPT up in Pasco County. We're working together along with FDOT, which has funded the development of the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan. Um, and we're working very closely with, with the MPOs and with TVARTA uh, to come together as a region uh, and do the technical work uh, to, to, to identify the strongest transit projects for our region to move forward um, and they could identify that they could be good candidates for federal funding um, and attract state and federal investment and actually be able to be built. Uh, so I'm going to, we did a, a wonderful job, I think, setting this up um, and, uh, and kind of giving a good sense of what the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan is. But I'll step back a little bit and kind of walk you through a little bit the, the process here uh, of developing the plan. Um, so, you know, in order to, to, to build a premium transit project, um, there's really kind of three legs to the stool. Um, and we're focused on the first one here. Um, what is that project to be built? But in order for it to actually get done, uh, there also has to be consideration of how it's going to be funded um, and who is responsible for building and maintaining it. Uh, so the focus of our effort um, with the Regional Transit Feasibility Plan is to identify the strongest project from a technical perspective, one that, uh, that, that would be most attractive uh, to attract federal and state uh, investment. Um, and these other uh, questions are important questions in order to be able to move forward and, and actually be able to build it. Now, we're working with Jacobs, uh, which is an international company with a local office in Tampa uh, to conduct the analysis and, and develop this regional transit feasibility plan. Um, and, you know, the reality is that we've done a lot of planning work in this, in this community. We know uh, that, the, that, that the growth that our region will see into the future is huge. Uh, and so it's really important for us to be looking uh, to solutions uh, out into the future anticipating the, the growth that we see in the future. The reality of a growing region is that we, we have to be looking proactively to uh, transit solutions and regional transit solutions that can move large amounts of people and do so in an efficient manner. So um, in this region, we've done a great job studying transit solutions. We've done in 30 years over 55 uh, studies. Um, we have had only one project, which is the, the project that, that we talked about and, and that PSTA is moving forward with, uh, which is that, um, that uh, uh, BRT project connecting uh, St. Pete to the beaches. Um, there's a, a capital investment project. There are federal dollars that are available in a, in a program that we haven't been able to access because we've done the studies, but we haven't been able to get from study to taking a project and being able to, to move it into that process because, uh, because one, we've come together as, as, as a community to support moving forward in, in, a, in a particular direction, and two, that we have the ability to actually get it built and, and operated um, with, with uh, local funding. So the purpose of our plan is, is threefold. One, 
is to identify projects that have the greatest uh, potential to be funded. So we're looking at the feasibility plan. We're looking at the feasibility of, plan of, of, of the project from a, uh, a technical perspective. We're also looking for projects that are forward thinking. So the transportation landscape is changing a lot. There's a lot of emerging technology. Um, that's one of the things that's very exciting about working in transit. Um, so we're looking uh, at, at projects that are forward thinking and take uh, advantage of uh, new technology. Um, and we're looking at a project and sets of projects that uh, best serve our region today and will help support the growth that we anticipate uh, in the future. Uh, so where are we? We're really at the halfway point uh, in, in the development of the plan. So you can kind of take the, the work effort here and divide it into two big chunks. Uh, the first big chunk is step one, two, and three, where we've identified uh, where the, the, the strongest transit connections are, kind of put those, get a sense of what markets would would we connect with premium transit? Um, in step two, uh, we look more specifically at what the modes are that match up well with the connections that we would make. And then in step three, we identify the how we start putting those products, those connections with the modes and, and, and the strongest connections, we drop them in space and start to look more specifically at, at projects and stations and develop the draft implementation plan. And then the, the next big chunk, the green section up here is the community vetting period, in which we have an opportunity to do intense public outreach and, and go out in several uh, phases to get input from the public on the draft implementation plan. Already in the first two steps and, and, and about halfway through the third step, uh, we've done a lot of presentations and meetings um, I encourage you to look at our website, tvregionaltransit.com, uh, to get more information, put an enormous amount of information up on the web so that folks can go on there and, and get a sense of the technical work and really see the, the work that's been, been done up to this point. So in the outreach that we've done so far, we've, we've heard a lot of different uh, comments. Um, a lot of comments when it comes to regional transit revolve around modes, rubber tire or steel wheel. Um, but we really heard uh, the, the comments have kind of run the gamut. Uh, but we also have heard some things consistently as well that have helped to guide the work and in some instances help to confirm uh, some of the things that we're seeing from a technical perspective. So I'll talk a little bit more uh, about that in a little bit. Um, but one of the things that we hear often from people when we're doing these outreaches and in the comments that we've gotten is we've been talking about transit, you guys talk about transit, and you talk about transit, and you study solutions, uh, but when are we going to actually see something? When, 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 can, we, when, we get, when can we step on a, a premium transit solution? So there's, there is a sense of impatience, um, too, that we certainly could feel from the, the outreach. Uh, so, like I said, step one focused on where the top connections were. Step two uh, added modes to those projects, so we started to look at modes that best serve those connections. Uh, and then in step three, we take the top projects, which match a mode with a connection, uh, and, and we uh, look at that in, in much more detail. Uh, so, throughout this process, we're, we're using the federal criteria because we want to ensure that we identify a project that's going to be competitive. Um, and, and that means looking at criteria that are very well established, that they're well, uh, the, the FTA criteria are well regarded um, and they're used because they, they actually identify good transit projects. So we're using these criteria because they're really important for us to meet that first objective of this this plan, which is to identify a project that's going to be attractive for federal and state funding. And of course, we're, we're looking at projects that serve our region today while also serving tomorrow's growth. So we look at, at job centers, population centers, and we look at what kind of growth we anticipate um, into the future in 2040 is what you see here. 
So Wynn talked about and showed this map up here that, that shows the overall regional transit vision. It's important to continue to think about what we're doing in the context of this larger uh, vision because it is important to recognize that, that transit uh, connections are really important. So we can build premium transit, but it doesn't operate on its own. It's part of a network. Um, and that's one of the things, and it's a theme I know that you've heard tonight and you've heard through the Tampa Bay Next process, um, is that no transportation solution exists on its own. They're all interwoven. And the ways in which we uh, work together and plan together um, are really, really important. And so all of this fits under the Tampa Bay Next umbrella because uh, all of these elements really are tied, are tied together. Um, so when, when you see these dark blue lines, those are the strongest regional connections. So when we do the technical uh, analysis, when we apply our evaluation criteria, these are the corridors that, uh, that, that perform the strongest. Um, the lighter blue lines are critical connections that help support that, uh, that, that kind of core uh, network, the strongest connections. And then, of course, it's important, too, to look at those orange lines which look at commuter connections that also help uh, to, to under, underpin the system. Um, and so when, you, when we look at that vision, when you look at the dark blue lines and the light blue lines, this network in 2040 uh, serves the majority uh, of jobs, six in 10. It serves half of residents. Uh, so it becomes a network that's, that serves a, 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 lot, a, a lot of people. And it's important as we as we uh, as we have this dialogue and, and with our partners from the three county area for us to continue to really look at the importance of, of us working together as one region and the importance of us you know focusing on the regional aspect here and identify the strongest project to move forward with first from a regional perspective. If we come together as a region and identify where the, the place is for us to start going to put us in a, in a position to, to be successful when we come together as one region with all, uh, all of the stakeholders um, united and together. Uh, so the, in, in step two, uh, one of the, the key aspects here was taking those top connections and applying modes. Uh, and of course, when you look at what modes make sense for different connections, there are a lot of different uh, factors that you look at. A primary one is you're looking at who you're moving. What what kind of um, what, what kind of market would you be serving, and what kind of mode makes sense to serve that market? Um, and so we looked at everything from ferry and aerial propelled transit um, to steel wheel and rail transit um, and and rubber solutions, uh, including things like autonomous vehicle solutions. And this is one of the things that's that's pretty exciting as part of this effort. It's, a lot, it's, it's the uh, rapid development of autonomous technology and its potential for adoption uh, in mass transit is really significant. Uh, we're excited over in Hillsborough County to be uh, leading that effort in the state of Florida. We'll, we'll be, uh, with a, an FDOT grant, we'll be launching an autonomous vehicle project on the Marion Street Transitway in downtown Tampa um, our vehicle will be here next month. Uh, we'll be unveiling it. We'll have service out on the Marion Transitway uh, early next year. Um, and we're excited to start testing that technology, seeing how it, it works in that corridor, and see in the future how it could also be applied in other ways, um, including the, the potential for autonomous solutions as part of a regional premium transit uh, uh, network. Uh, so when we think about rail and, um, and rubber tire bus rapid transit solutions, we can also think about and apply the, the potential for, for autonomous uh, rail or autonomous rubber tire solutions. Uh, and, and that's a pretty, pretty exciting thing. Uh, so what we'll see here is a vehicle that looks something like that on the Marion Transit Way. Um, it, it's a pretty slow moving vehicle. It moves about 15 miles an hour. It has certain constraints for its operating environment. There's an enormous amount of innovation happening around autonomous vehicles. This vehicle in the bottom right, um, out of the Netherlands, um, is a vehicle that 
uh, that can actually reach, I think, operating speeds of like 45 miles an hour. Um, and the potential for autonomous vehicle technology when you start looking at it in its own lane is really uh, pretty, pretty incredible as well. A lot of these autonomous solutions operate in mixed traffic. When you start looking at a rubber tire uh, autonomous vehicle that operates in its own fixed uh, lane, uh, you have a lot of potential uh, to, to operate at even higher speeds, uh, which is something that is important for us to, to look at when, it, when we're looking at long distances that, that, that we're looking at for regional connectivity. Uh, so we, we, we took the top modes, uh, the top connections, matched up modes to them, um, and we got 15 total, uh, 15 total projects. So we started with a total of 65 connections. Uh, we narrowed it down to the blue lines, the dark blue lines, those top five. We matched up three modes uh, to each connection, giving us 15 projects. Um, and then we took from the 15 projects and we applied, again, looking at the FTA uh, criteria, looking at return on investment, impact, benefits, and integrating the, the input from public opinion. And it got us narrowed down uh, to identifying the, the top projects to move forward into the, into the next uh, phase, if we're, uh, if, into the next step, which we're involved in right now. Uh, so this is what we found from a technical ranking uh, perspective. Uh, so in the end, there were no big surprises, right? So in, in a lot of ways, the, a lot of the technical work that has been done over the last 30 years was confirmed from what we, from, from this work effort. We found that really the two strongest uh, connections uh, are the, the Wesley Chapel USF Tampa Gateway St. Petersburg connection, which is a very long, long connection, but it's a really important one, uh, and it performs very well. Uh, and also the other connection that performs very well is downtown Tampa to the USF area. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages of uh, rubber tire and light rail in each of those uh, corridors, but it shows us that that those projects sort of rise to the top when you, when you do the technical uh, analysis. Yes? Um, so uh, the difference between an exclusive lane is just the, the transit vehicle operating in that lane. A toll lane, um, while it would give some advantage to the transit vehicle, it still would operate with other traffic. We integrated the, the um, as I mentioned before, some of the input from the public uh, during the, the public input period. Um, and, uh, and again, it, it helped us to confirm in some ways some of what we found in the technical in the technical work. Those same corridors are the ones that, those, those same connections are the ones that rise, rise to the top. So we put it all together, our preliminary ranking. So this isn't final by any means at this point, this, the, the yellow, uh, projects are the ones that we're taking forward and that we're looking at uh, in, in more detail, in more depth, placing some of these uh, projects actually in space, looking at station locations, applying, uh, uh, applying technical analysis using our evaluation criteria, uh, looking at cost in much more detail um, to get a better sense of uh, sort of how these projects would be implemented as part of our, the development of the draft implementation plan. So, um, I, you know, I, I already kind of covered where, where we are with the top, uh, those top two connections, the modes that we're looking at. Um, in, the next, uh, in the next step, we will look at the alignments, place these uh, projects in space, uh, we'll do uh, value engineering, so we're looking at, we're really looking at trying to find projects that perform really well uh, from a cost perspective uh, to, to, to benefit, to ridership uh, benefit. We'll look at uh, phasing, the prioritization for implementation, uh, and for January, we will have the draft implementation plan, which identifies kind of where the starting point uh, uh, 
where, where we, we see the starting point from a technical perspective, and we'll take it out to the public to get input and, and then come back out to the public to continue to refine the, the plan in order to get to uh, in order to get to a, a final plan uh, this time next year, uh, in which we'll be ready to take uh, a project or a series of projects into the project uh, project development process uh, with the Federal Transit Administration. So with that, I know you've heard a lot about transportation and transit safety, uh, but I know there will be time to talk more one-on-one, -on -one, and I'll be here happy to, to answer questions uh, that you might have. Thanks again, Brad. And I'd like to thank all of our presenters this evening. So this concludes the presentation portion of our evening. All of the presenters, uh, along with some of the colleagues, will be in the back and can answer your questions. You can look at your map. And I also want to mention that Bob Lasher is here from CSPA, and he has a table set up as well. If you have any questions for him, he's here to answer your questions. And once again, I want to remind you, if you have any comments, any suggestions, any questions, Please fill out the comment card. They will be included in the real time record and translated so everybody will hear your comments and they'll be included in future projects. Thank you so much for coming this evening and being a part of Tampa Bay Next. Enjoy the rest of the evening. Before we break, just in case there are any questions uh, while well, Wit's still here and um, with uh, our geometric and technical experts, anything for the group that you want to throw out there? I mean, do some sausage making, anything out there? If not, we'll, uh, we'll be here. Yes, sir.
So one of the big differences in these different modes that you have to look at is when, and, the, and DOT is looking at regional transit. And travel time is going to be an important factor to consider. And from everything I've seen with these elevated transit systems, they're upwards of 28 to 30 miles an hour as an average speed. And that's probably not too bad on surface streets and around Pinellas County, but when you're looking at going long distances over the bridge, getting between our counties, uh, to be competitive, you're going to need to go with uh, faster travel time. So that's something that we would have to consider from an effective standpoint. I'll let you weigh in on whether the state might have a role. Yeah, you know, from a state's role, we're, uh, we, we kind of stand by to help participate in funding. Um, Marco uh, mentioned that, that through the FTA process, that's the big dog in the game for any regional transit if it goes through the process. And it's different than transportation dollars because a lot of ours is uh, formula-based, population growth, those kind of things. You go try and get transit dollars, as Marco was talking about, that's, that's competition. That's federal taxpayers. Somebody in Iowa is going to pay their taxes to come here to Florida, and Floridians the same way on the competitive. So it has to be a return on investment. Does it really make sense to put that somewhere in the United States? So, um, so we stand by, we match 25%. If the locals come up with their 25%, so it'd probably be very similar. Got a long way to answer. Probably a very similar federal 25%, 25% if it went through the process in the spring now. Yes, sir? Did they figure out the technology was going to go from the intermodal at Charlie over to where the airport stopped in there all the dire thing? The question is the with Charlie Steakhouse and the Double Tree Hotel, the department owns that parcel. Um, and how to get to the uh, Tampa International Airport. There's been some discussions in the past, and I don't want to say studies since they were finalized for hearings or anything. Um, what kind of mode could get there? The, uh, I can't remember the date, but uh, came from Japan. Tokyo just delivered the autonomous vehicles from rubber tire vehicles. They went to TIA, they came to the Port of Tampa, there was a ceremony with uh, the mayor of Buckhorn and uh, uh, Governor Scott came out. Those are there. They have a, it goes to their on rack facility, they call it their rental car facility. There is a stub out, so possibly at some point it could be a people mover, the rubber tire people mover could go there. Um, it could be other modes. Things are changing so fast right now. The biggest thing with that right now is nobody's come up with a plan on the big network. Who's going to fund it? Who's, where's it going to go? There's operations, there's op options up O'Brien Street to talk about, getting across Cypress, coming around the West Shore Interchange when we build the ultimate interchange, whatever that is in TDX, can we sneak it in there um, around the corner? Um, but as far as partners with City of Tampa, TIA, and the department, um, we don't know what mode uh, where that could go. I will say West Shore Alliance just kicked off a circulator study. And let me elaborate just real quick. Um, they're moving forward with a circulator study that's going to incorporate some of that as our scope of services. So hopefully we start to get some traction on what that could be, who's willing to partner with that. Um, but then also the intermodal center study, I think it was Witter, someone mentioned, um, we're going to start this year. If transit came to our BRT, rubber tire, kind of coordinated with Marco, we're going to kick off this year where those intermodal centers could be, how that all interacts, all the way from Wesley Chapel, uh, possibly the USF area. Uh, well, obviously, we own Charlie's, we own the old uh, jail site down in downtown Tampa. We're looking at uh, Gateway, so but there has been one way to answer no discussion or no finalization on what that could be. So there's a lot in the air. Circulator could be maybe a, an autonomous vehicle at some point to make that trip for you rather than investing several hundred million for, I think it's 1.4 miles for what TIA did, so let's go through the process. Good question, though. Uh, but if you'd like uh, any more information, tampabaynext.com, if you throw uh, a comment in there, I can circle you up with the, uh, with the project manager for the uh, uh, multimodal center study, if you'd like to keep in the loop on that. Nothing else. Um, Ed, he was talking about the Citizens Academy. If you go on TampaBayNext.com, it says get involved. Go on there. They're ready to go right there. Uh, uh, there was yes, the one the other day was about uh, transit um, and modes. The one on Friday, the 27th, is going to be how to fund it. Because that's the big drill in the room. Everybody says, why don't transit? It's great. Well, if you pull some statistics, you know, the cost benefit of what we do, it's going to take everybody to get this done. I think I pulled the the numbers from Charlotte, um, because that's a re region uh, that people would talk about lately. Their light rail system is moving about 17,000 people per day. We have hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people we need to move every day. So that's one of the pieces of the pie. Um, but this, so this, this transit primer, we'll talk about that, how we fund those things as part of the 
use other products. Just want to put a plug in for that. All right, we will be around. Anything else? Thank you so much for being here.